Okay, science theory, so blood structure and function. Um, we're here, we're going to talk about what makes up blood. So blood is not just red blood cells. There's a lot more to blood than red blood cells. And so most of your uh, component of blood is not actually red blood cells. It's something called plasma. We're going to talk about what's in all of that and then different structures of what they do. And so when we're looking at blood cells, we've got three major components. Red blood cells, which make up a little less than half of what's in your actual blood. So what you see when you look at that red blood that comes out of a cut, 45% of that is red blood cells, typically carry oxygen. About uh, less than a percentage in a normal healthy individual are white blood cells and these other cells called platelets. And then the rest of it, 55% of what makes up your blood is plasma. And it's got this weird looking yellow off white color and we'll kind of focus on that as well in a second. And so one drop of blood has approximately 1 million red blood cells, um, and new red blood cells are made every 120 days, roughly, in your body. So you're constantly replenishing blood. This is why it's really good to donate blood, because not only are you helping uh, blood banks with the amount of blood that they can use in emergency situations, but you are also providing a sort of forced situation in your body to make new red blood cells, which is healthy. So blood donation is very important, both for society as well as for your own health. Um, when you take a sample of blood and you throw it in something called a centrifuge, it's this very fast moving uh, system that takes a sample of blood and spins it to the point where it actually pushes and separates different components of blood based off of their weight. Red blood cells settle at the bottom, white blood cells and platelets in the middle, and then plasma above it. And that's because red blood cells are a heavier molecule. They're carrying oxygen, they have iron components to them. And so they're the heaviest of the three, or four, I should say. Okay, here's another set of pictures. Red blood cells typically have this biconcave shape, kind of look like a, like a donut uh, without the hole in the middle, right? So they kind of go in on both sides. We call that biconcave. Uh, white blood cells, typically more globular looking structures. They've got kind of a thicker weight to them. And then uh, they're significantly larger usually than red blood cells. So uh, in any single sample of blood, you're going to have far more red blood cells than white blood cells. These are just three different images to show a sample of blood. This is a dyed image. This is a uh, computer rendered uh, image uh, using a high magnification digital microscope. And this is a, obviously a drawing of a blood sample. And so to begin, let's discuss well, what makes blood plasma. So blood plasma is that top 55% roughly, right? They, it, it's quite a thick portion and it's that off white color. Well, the majority of blood plasma is water. Blood plasma is gonna contain something called antibodies, which we'll talk about in the next video regarding immunity. Uh, it's gonna contain fibrinogen and fibrinogen and fibrin, we'll learn about it. It's for blood clotting. Uh, dissolved gases, oxygen and uh, other gases well, oxygen is going to be carried in the red blood cells, but carbon dioxide and other gases other than oxygen, I should say, are going to be dissolved inside the plasma. Sugars are inside of your blood plasma. Vitamins, minerals are all, just, all carried in your blood plasma and waste products. So all of that stuff that we said was moved in the blood, well, it's actually moved in the plasma of the blood. Anything that's going to help benefit or buffer acid-base differences in the blood is going to be also carried in that plasma. So the plasma is a very vital part of your blood, which is why it makes up 55% of a single sample of blood. So we talked about buffers. Buffers are in that plasma. And what's the purpose of a buffer? Well, we just finished our chemistry unit. We talked about how buffers are uh, going to be these chemical components of a system that stop the system from changing in any significant direction, either above or below in pH. So it stops some, the sample from increasing in pH or decreasing in pH to a certain extent. Buffers have a limit, and sometimes if you stress that buffer too much, it will no longer be able to withhold pH change, and pH will eventually change. Uh, but buffers in the blood are very helpful and very efficient at keeping a constant pH in the body. Now you want a constant pH in the body right around neutral because anything too acidic, then you're going to have organ and cell death and damage. 
anything too basic and it's going to cause the same thing, cell death and damage. And so the buffer in our blood is called carbonic acid and hydrogen carbonate and these help buffer pH changes. So even a change of more than 0.5 on the pH scale can be fatal to the body. The next blood type we should talk about is the one you've always heard about, red blood cells. They have a biconcave shape. They're easy to tell in any diagram. Uh, they don't have a nucleus, and they're like one of the only cells in the body that don't have a nucleus. They are designed for one thing and one thing only, and that's oxygen transportation. They contain a, a protein called hemoglobin. Globin is anything globular is usually referring to a protein, and then heme refers to blood. So this is a blood protein. So hemoglobin, a blood protein, is going to help with the transportation of oxygen and iron. And so hemoglobin contains iron, uh, where that heme sort of prefix comes from, and that protein is going to help absorb or bind oxygen uh, gas and allow it to be moved throughout the body. So we like to carry oxygen to the blood cells so we can drop off CO2 out of the blood cells back into the blood in order to get carried to the lungs to get exhaled out. Now, all blood cells are made inside of your bone, which is something that not a lot of people recognize at first. So your bone marrow is that center goo inside of your bone. So your bone might seem solid, but the bone marrow is actually a fluid in the core of your bone. And all blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, originate inside of the bone marrow. So every time you produce new blood cells, new uh, immunity cells, they all come from the bone marrow. And so we can take stem cells uh, from the bone marrow and uh, utilize it in research. So a stem cell is a cell that can become, it's called multipotent. It can become a lot of different things. And it's the potential to become multiple different types of cells. So stem cells located in your bone marrow can become hair cells, they could become skin cells, or they could become blood cells, or any other number of cells. But the important thing to recognize is that uh, in terms of blood cell production, the stem cells from the bones are deciding to become a certain type of blood cell. And that's the wonderful thing about stem cells and that's why stem cells are so important in research. So to do a bone marrow transplant or to withdraw bone marrow from an individual, it's kind of graphic, but it's actually, uh, you use quite a thick gauge needle and you bore right into the center of the bone. And there's a lot of good bones in the body that you can utilize to retrieve bone marrow from, uh, where it's the least invasive and you get the most bone marrow, but you can see them withdrawing the bone marrow here. Um, a little graphic, but and you can see how thick that gauge needle is, but it is uh, allowing us to withdraw bone marrow uh, for stem cell research, or perhaps some patients need a bone marrow transplant or bone marrow uh, product donations. And so you can choose to actually donate portions of your bone marrow, assuming you're the right blood type match to another individual, and then you, could ha you would have this procedure done. Um, if you've ever had a, a dinner and maybe you've eaten like a lamb, Sometimes the bone of that individual uh, or that meal is on your plate and you can actually scoop out or slurp out the, the core of the bone and that's the bone marrow. So bone marrow is uh, also a food. Um, just usually it's of animals and not humans. Gross. Okay, so leukocytes uh, are a fancy name for white blood cells. So white blood cells or leukocytes are going to be cells that uh, well, first of all, they're the largest cell in the body. Uh, they have their nucleus, unlike white, unlike red blood cells, which don't have a nucleus. And the function of white blood cells is, well, a couple. There's a couple. So first of all, white blood cells, they fight infection. White blood cells are your immune response cell. They do a couple things, and there's a couple different kinds of white blood cells. In Science 30, Bio 20, we learn about a certain few. Um, if you take immunology in university, you will learn a lot more uh, different cells that are under the leukocyte or white blood cell category but have a significantly deeper uh, and more specific role. So white blood cells at their simplest make antibodies and white blood cells uh, tend to, or a certain type of white blood cells tend to engulf or eat pathogens. So uh, a pathogen is a cell, that, an invading cell or invading bacterium or an invading uh, something that doesn't belong in the body 
And so certain types of white blood cells can engulf or phagocytose uh, that invading cell or that pathogen. And I'll show you what that looks like. So um, platelets are a cell that are involved in blood clotting. And so they're, they're not really a cell. Platelets are more of a, a web or a goo, and they float throughout the blood much like all the cells would. But their, their job is to look for a, any hole or cut or tear in a blood vessel uh, and then clot that up. So it basically forms a web or a net um, and reinforces the wall of the blood vessel to stop you from bleeding out. And so any cut or, or uh, incision you get is going to be eventually sealed over in terms of the blood vessel portion by a platelet. So blood clotting is where the platelets come in and they interact with calcium and another molecule called fibrinogen to create that clot. And I'll show you what that looks like here. Um, so what would happen first is platelets are going to hit a rough edge of a ruptured blood vessel. So the platelets are floating along in the bloodstream and they're going to all of a sudden stumble across a tear in a blood vessel. Maybe this is a paper cut, maybe this is a knife cut um, or stab. And so what's going to happen here is your platelets are going to try to come in, they're going to notify the body that there is a, a cut and then uh, the platelets get to work. So immediately the platelets start to accumulate around that region where there's a rupture in the blood vessel and they release two things. The first thing that they release is this um, molecule called thromboplastin and the other is calcium ions, calcium 2 plus ions. So the thromboplastin gets released from the platelets and the calcium gets released from the platelets and both the thromboplastin and the calcium that have been released by the platelet when it sees this rupture or cut in the blood vessel, um, it, those two components, thromboplastin and calcium, start converting fibrinogen, which is some other molecule that is floating in the blood at all times, into a more active, useful clotting factor called fibrin. So fibrin then is this sort of burlap sack that I like to think of it as, and that burlap sack is used then to reinforce the wall of the blood vessel and stops the blood vessels from uh, allowing, to re allowing red blood cells and plasma to, to flow out and bleed. And so just as a review, platelets are floating throughout the blood, platelets hit a cut in the blood vessel, they start freaking out, they notify the body that there is a cut, by producing thromboplastin and releasing calcium ions. Thromboplastin and calcium ions are then gonna convert fibrinogen, which is also in the blood at this time, into a more active, useful clotting form called fibrin. And then that fibrin is gonna actually go, that's those little purple things here, the fibrin is gonna go and really bunch up and gum up the holes and the cracks of that blood vessel so that we don't lose blood through that cut. It's quite an ingenious method. Okay, so uh, you can take a look at this if you want, but there's some uh, cosmetic methods where we can actually use platelet-rich plasma and inject it below the surface of the skin where you have wrinkles, and uh, it sort of uh, reduces the wrinkles. Uh, it's a uncomfortable-looking procedure, but people pay money to have it done. Uh, if we look at this image, I can see some various different blood vessels. So I've got a red blood cell here, right? I've got these larger cells, which are white blood cells, and I've got these little uh, fibrous looking things that don't quite make up real cells, and those are our platelets. So you can see them there. Okay, some disorders of blood. Uh, we're actually going to do this in the next video. So I'll stop this video here, and then the next video we'll do disorders, and then the video after that we'll do immunity. Thanks, guys.